Well, good evening, and uh, thank you very much for coming out on a wintry night. I hope that we will warm you up. Uh, I we're each of the panelists is going to introduce uh, his or her uh, thinking in a one minute di dissertation, and then we're going to open the discussion. Uh, so I think we'll go from left to right. So if you would, if you would go first, okay. David. You, you just you want yeah. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation with the Rationalist Society. Um, you, one would say that the, the Rationalists may, may, or Secularists may make up the majority of the Australian society. So I'm glad that we came, came to this uh, conversation. I've got three very quick premises that I want to mention uh, that I'm going to speak from. The first thing is that uh, in relation to Islam, uh, uh, I think that Islam is fundamentally a religion that Muslims have to submit themselves so that they could be transformed for the better. That if they, if they, don't, if they do not enroll or be coachable through Islam, they end up transforming Islam into who they are, which is really skewed. That's number one. And number two, I really think that Islam gives Muslims an independent frame of thinking. Uh, through its teachings and the sources and the worldview that it offers. And I think that uh, that is a valuable thing that Muslims should not lose. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't engage with other worldviews and traditions, but Islam uh, does offer an independent way of thinking, and that should be the starting point of all Muslims. Um, and I can give you examples later through the evening. Uh, my third uh, important premise in relation to how we should view Islam is that uh, Islam, uh, I believe, is a fundamentally, the, the, one of the overarching values is that it's a religion of balance. The expression Surat al-Mustaqim appears in 34 places in the Quran as an overarching character of the religion. And it means a, a straight path, a path of balance. Uh, so, so I approach every issue from a perspective of balance, because I think that's the Islamic view. So not go into left extreme, not go into the right extreme, and, and stick to the middle ground. And that's where I think is the independent, uh, the voice of Islam lies. Thank you. Okay. Back in 2013, I traveled to Uganda with a South African friend of mine to visit a young Ugandan doctor whom I'd met in Australia. Um, Angela had won an AusAid scholarship to study a master's in public health at Melbourne University and I'd become her mentor. Now she got through the course and it was one of the requirements of this scholarship that she returned to Uganda for at least two years after completing the course. So I went to visit her. But while I was there, I also visited um, a little town called Kasezi. Kasezi is about 200 k's west of the capital of Uganda. It's an old British railway town. And in Kasezi, there is a small humanist school called the Kasezi Humanist Primary School, founded by a guy called uh, Wambale Robert. And the Rationalist Society has been supporting the Kasezi Humanist Primary School for some time. While I was there, the, so the school has the motto, with science, we can progress. And uh, Wambale thought that it was safer to make reference to science rather than to uh, humanism because in Uganda, um, the number of people who are not religious are, is less than 1%. So it's actually safer to make reference to science. Anyway, while I was there, they asked me to give a little talk to some of the kids and they asked me questions like um, why are there kangaroos only in Australia and um, what is a humanist? So I could answer the first question but and, and the second question I, I used the sort of throwaway line which we were talking about before it, when people ask me about the RSA, the Rationalist Society, and I say, well, we're in favour of science and evidence as opposed to superstition and bigotry, which always gets, oh, yes, yeah, that sounds really good. But in the context of talking to a class of 10-year-old Ugandans, um, it didn't, uh, on reflection, it wasn't quite adequate. And I was really thinking about this later when I came back, and 
So here's, I think, what I should have said. A humanist or a rationalist is a person who believes in three fundamental things. One is that the natural world that we see around us is the only world there is. There's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no life after death. Secondly, the best way for humans to improve their lives is through the use of science and the scientific, the application of the scientific method, combined with the uniquely human capacity for language and reason. And thirdly, that as humans, we are responsible for our own lives. We are responsible for doing good and being good. We should neither blame some external god or gods when things go wrong, nor should we praise some god or gods when things go right. So these are the three fundamental pillars of what I believe as a rationalist. I'm sure we'll get into um, more detail as we go on, but that's what I'd like to um, offer to you at the beginning. Uh, I'll try and keep to a minute. <laughs> um, I grew up a Catholic. I decided at 18 that I did not believe Catholic doctrine or teaching, but I set out to understand where it had all come from. Um, and you could say that, that wisdom, if we get it, it all comes relatively late in life. I, I have been writing in recent years based on what I've learned in a long life of searching. One of my books is called The West in a Nutshell, Foundations, Fragilities, Futures. Another is called Credo and Twelve Poems, A Cosmological Manifesto. Uh, just as it happens, uh, um, I mentioned that I review books and so on. Um, this arrived in the mail today for me to review. And I was saying to the others before over dinner, this addresses, I think, where we're all at. We're all in the same boat in the 21st century. Uh, and I see the kind of dialogue we're engaged in here this evening as an effort to figure out how collectively, cooperatively and intelligently do we face the challenges of the 21st century, because they're big. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Hannah Asafiri. I'm somebody who is born Muslim into a Muslim household and family. Um, and as a result, I was uh, abused, dissuaded, traumatised, violated, all in the name of Islam and um, rejected Islam and thought if there is a God that created me only to be treated in this way as an object of somebody else's uh, desire or not, uh, then that God is not for me. So as I got older, I began to explore uh, meaning of life and I looked to all isms, feminism, Marxism, communism, Buddhism, uh, environmentalism, atheism even, and dabbled with uh, Christianity, Judaism, and came back full circle to an understanding of Islam that is founded on and is a natural partner of human rights, social justice, is a balanced perspective that is founded on justice, not apology, um, that is rational in its expression and its execution whose departure from those principles has been had certainly over the last few centuries and we can sit here and explain why and colonisation etc. But nonetheless we can all accept that Islamic societies are not the same as Islam itself and their departure from Islamic principles um, in my view are because or one of the main components that not many people speak about, we've severed women from the conversation, from the contribution to the conceptualization of Islam and its meaning, because Islam, and we were saying this earlier, um, unlike the other two institutions, um, the monolithic institutions, uh, does not have a hierarchy. It does not need to legitimate you through a pope or a bishop or another medium, that it's direct access spiritually between you and your engagement and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your interpretation of those principles. Um, so that's notwithstanding all the factions and the warring and, and etc and what's unfolding around us at the moment. And I think we can offer a, a smarter, more nuanced understanding and we do not need to 
hold in opposition reason and faith. They can form and inform one another. And in fact, Islam's premise is only if you're learned and knowledgeable can you truly understand Islam. So I'm looking forward to a conversation tonight about uh, setting the two up in opposition or rather forming and informing one another. Sorry, um, Madam Housekeeper, do we need to pass the microphone around or will these microphones do the job? We'll share this too. We'll share this, this one. This one. What are these for? They're for the video camera. The video. I beg your pardon. Okay, so we do need to. Yes, try to sorry. Yeah. All right. Well, so we've got a couple of strands here. One is uh, Islam's place in a secular society, and the other is a communal understanding of how society should be organized against a, tradition, a traditional Western liberal or autonomous understanding. So my first question, critics of Islam sometimes say that it is incompatible with democracy. Hmm. And now the vast majority of Muslims living in Australia seem to find no conflict, but some are highly critical of democracy. So for my Muslim uh, interlocutors, what problems does Islam have with democracy? And for my rationalist interlocutors, what problems does democracy have with Islam? <laughs> so let's start with you, Helen. <laughs> Give me the easy one. Um, I, I don't think there is uh, an incompatibility between Islam and democracy. I think when Islam butts up against a system of injustice, uh, there will be tensions. Uh, and again, we need to explain what democracy is. And, and I think we're seeing the failings of democracy at the moment all around us. I mean, if democracy can celebrate the ill treatment of the socially vulnerable, if it can celebrate treating asylum seekers and not reconciling mm -hmm. with indigenous people and having homelessness on the streets of Melbourne, that is the failings of democracy around us. So it is butting up against basic social and community justice principles. Islam and democracy, in my understanding, and certainly in where I find my empowerment as a Muslim woman of faith, there is no uh, incompatibility whatsoever. It is, in fact, plural. And I go back to what we were saying earlier. In Islam, there is no compulsion to force others to be like you uh, or to superimpose your opinion onto others. And I think the way in which we've departed from the very meaning of Islam uh, is because we are... Uh, I guess there's little understanding and insight. Um, and I go back to a gendered explanation because most households are raised by women and when you sever women from uh, an understanding and an ability to participate and an ability to then raise attitudes that are informed and empowered, this is what you have. So we can't be lazy and just accept that the uh, interpretation of Islam at odds with Western democracy and there's somehow a clash of civilizations. There is no clash and there is absolutely no incompatibility in my view. Well, is she right, Paul? <laughs> I thought can we were going to ask can I add next. to that? Can I add to well, that? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to break it up with uh, one at a time. Uh, but if but I, 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 I've got something to say, though. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> that's, you, you go now. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Hannah, I, I agree with you, but I'd just like to add that uh, the Muslims have uh, the idea of sovereign elections and self determination and involving everybody in the, uh, the fate of the country and society, like uh, changing power through elections. These were debated by Muslim uh, intellectuals and scholars in 19th century. Hmm. There was a, in um, 1876, parliament was established in, in Ottoman Empire. Uh, and they were all talking about uh, uh, republic. Republic was the demo name for democracy at the time, or self-determination. Most Muslim scholars were for it. But what happened was the, the entire Muslim na uh, world was colonized. So it really broke that d development curve that the Western world went through, a natural development path in terms of democracy. And democracy only in the last 20 years has become the dominant regime in the world. Uh, we shouldn't forget that. So I think uh, uh, there's no problem as, so, as such with uh, Islam and democracy, or Muslims and democracy. That Muslims just have to develop a, a version of democracy that is suitable for their own society and, uh, and history. Um, and, and I would say that that should be a liberal democracy. It should not be a totalitarian, what, whatever they have. Um, yeah, but we, th there has been issues. Uh, one key aspect, though, uh, uh, I should be honest here, and admittedly that 
the place of Islamic law in a democratic society, especially secular liberal democracy, is still uncertain. It hasn't been really thought out well or applied. And I also see that it can be done, it's just that it needs to be applied, tried, and, and best practices developed over time. Thank you. Um, there's an organization in London called Quilliam, which some of you will be aware of. And it was set up uh, to oppose radicalism and jihadism within the Islamic world by a number of men who used to be jihadists. They were Hizbut Toya activists. Majid Noaz is one of them, and he was out here a couple of years ago, and he spoke at a public forum, and he spoke very well. He came across as a very pleasant, very <coughs> civilized person. And at a certain point, he was asked this question um, by the interviewer. And he said, no, I don't see any incompatibility between Islam and democracy. After all, he said, let's remind ourselves that Muhammad at Medina gave the world its first constitution. I nearly fell out of my seat. I nearly fell out of my seat. And, and yet nobody from the audience interjected. I politely waited till the Q&A, raised my hand, but I wasn't asked to ask my question. His statement was absolute and utter nonsense and doesn't help to forward the kind of agenda we have to bring forward, which is how you integrate Islam along with other religions and, uh, and non-religious, even anti-religious people, into a harmonious liberal society. That's the big challenge. The first constitutions uh, that we would recognise in the terms we're talking about now, in terms of democratic governance, were in Greek city-states a thousand years before, uh, before Muhammad. And they were very different to what he laid down at Medina. When Aristotle got together to write his book, The Politics, in the late fourth century BC, he drew on 160 different Greek city-state constitutions as samples. So uh, I think what we need to do here is, is not get into an argument about whether Islam is intrinsically compatible. We need to bring it along to be compatible because in the West we had to get Christianity to be compatible. That was a long fight. I'd, you know, I'd still like to know where you think it's not compatible, though. Well, you see, you have a rarefied definition of Islam, which is that it's all the good things. But as you yourself have said, if you look at Iran today, at Saudi Arabia today, at Jordan today, at Pakistan today, at Nigeria today, none of them bear a faint resemblance to what we would be aiming at in terms of liberal democracy. Or sure, tolerance. but look at the US as well. That doesn't resemble uh, Western democracy and certainly uh, civil society at the moment either with who's at the helm. So you mm. can't conflate. Uh, I guess is this okay to have the conversation? We no, can't Meredith, conflate. Okay. Meredith thinks I would say. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I, I think I find it um, the second part of your question, Barney, was: um, <coughs> Is democracy compatible with Islam? Well, with what, what problems does democracy? What have? problems does democracy have? So, let's distinguish democracy as social justice with democracy as a political system. Dem democracy is a political system. It's, it's not an ideology of social justice. Um, so as a political system, can liberal democracy accommodate Islam? Of course it can. Uh, but we would argue that the best way of doing that is through secularism. That is a separation between religion and the government, religion and the state. And that goes for Christianity, <coughs> or Buddhism, or Hinduism, or Islam. There is the political system of governance of the people that is separate from the, uh, what people might choose to believe as their own personal faith. Now, that's not to say that people of faith should be prevented from speaking in the public arena, in political debate. Of course not. How can you stop somebody thinking and expressing what's in their mind. In fact, I don't, I don't really mind what people believe in the privacy of their own minds. What I do mind is when they try to impose it on others. And I particularly mind when they try to impose it on others using public institutions. That's what, that is against a truly secular society. And secularism is, would protect religions as much as protect people who do not have faith. Can I just, uh, can I just say something that just because there are uh, Muslim countries, Iran or other countries are failing in terms of political sense or they're not delivering the progress that uh, one would expect, it does not mean Islam is not compatible with democracy. Hmm. It just means democracy is not there in, in those countries. Like there's no evidence 
to suggest it's fallacious thinking that that's the case. Just to, let's take Iran for example. In the Western world, it took three centuries, maybe even longer, to establish democracy. Uh, most of the Muslim countries gained their freedom after World War II. Uh, Iran was a democracy in 1950. Mossadegh government uh, won a democratic <coughs> election. And but 1953, we now we now know when the documents are all state documents are released, there was a coup uh, that uh, CIA initiated coup in Iran to topple the Mossadegh government. Mm. That brought in a Shah era, and the injustices of the Shah brought in uh, the Iranian Islamic Revolution. Mm. Now, who is responsible for not having democracy in Iran? The form of democracy that we have in Iran is one that many Muslims probably think is the best sort, where you have elections. I don't so think I don't think many Muslims would okay. agree with the Iranian. But, but whatever the parliament does or whatever democratic decisions are made uh, have no authority if the mullahs decide that they're bad. So uh, now the problem with Iranian democracy is that there's no freedom of press. The 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 candidates you cannot have the candidates are all whitewashed and chosen by the authority, so you don't have the proper oppositions and so the, the will of the people, the, there's no options before people to choose from and that they cannot freely discuss these things, that's the problem. Uh, in much of the Muslim world, the free press is a big problem. You need that uh, for democracy to function, otherwise how do you know truth, how do you put politicians to account? You know? Yeah, but I think that you raised the problem that most uh, non-Muslims think about when you answered in the first place and that is the face of Islamic law when it may seem to conflict uh, with democratic principles of freedom. Is such a conflict inevitable? Uh, look, I don't think uh, Islamic law conflicts with democracy. The only thing is that Islamic law is a religious-based uh, legal system. Uh, it, it served Muslims for more than a thousand years. It was actually the most sophisticated legal system uh, in much of the medieval era in the world. Um, but once again, the, when you see, when you look at the Islamic law's development, the, the last development took place in Ottoman Empire in uh, 1856 to 1876 with Majalla uh, reforms. Uh, and, uh, but it couldn't develop after that. We're talking about 150 years of gap in the development of Islamic law. It's a dynamic legal system. It is, when you look at it now, it looks backward. I admittedly agree with that. But with the, the, the main challenge with Islamic law is, is that in a secular liberal democracy, if you, if you don't want the, the lawmakers to, be, to take religion into account, that then most, a lot of Muslims have a problem with that because they feel that there are good principles in Islam, Islamic law have something to offer. But then if you take Islamic law into account in lawmaking, how are you going to do that? that this, that's a challenge. And uh, it is really not resolved, and it's not applied properly. No one has theorized uh, about how to go about that, with maybe the exception of uh, Malaysia. In Malaysia, there's a siyasat um, sharia system where they say that as long as the parliament has right, uh, the, the right experts and right people, whatever they pass should be Islamically okay, as long as they are constituted through a constitution that is Islamically sanctioned, uh, then whatever laws passed by bar, uh, parliament is by default Islamically okay. You know, there's these ideas, but again, these are not truly tested. Uh, it's an it's a open ground. Yeah. I, I think we should probably move on. Uh, we've spoken for a little while. My second question, Islam, uh, like Christianity for most of its history, is a highly communal religion. Faith is not just a relationship with the divine, but lived out in community. Hence the Western emphasis on individual autonomy, often expressed in the language of rights, come at a cost? And if so, what? Where do you want to start? Um, we'll start with you, Paul. And then oh. go to <laughs> <laughs> well, I said earlier that I grew up a Catholic and then rejected Catholicism at the age of 18. And I can tell you that there was a cost to that, not because I was persecuted by anybody. I wasn't. I lived in a in a fine community. But I had cut myself off from that community by announcing that I don't believe these things and I won't go to church anymore. Um, I think that that is an issue with individualism because many people become uprooted. They don't have a community with heritage, ritual, traditions. And I empathize with those people 
who want to hang on to something like that. What I've sought to understand is how do we move that into the 21st century? And what I said earlier about Islam and democracy fits into the same brief. How do we conduct a dialogue, as we are indeed this evening, about bringing that agenda along? Um, you know, there was a very good book that I stumbled upon in Zurich in a trip in Europe recently called Educated by a girl, by a woman now, who had grown up in a Mormon survivalist family in Idaho. And uh, she managed to get out from underneath an authoritarian and rather violent father, uh, got herself an education in history and philosophy, and remarkably ended up at, uh, getting a PhD at Harvard, an extraordinary accomplishment in itself. What she found, however, was that having become enlightened, it had created a gulf between her and her Mormon family. They couldn't even communicate properly anymore. That's a big challenge we all face. And, and I think we need to be both honest and compassionate about that, and because that's a problem for many people in the Islamic world right now. And, and if, if people conduct a search like Hannah says she did uh, from inside a Muslim tradition, and they come to a view that they see as fully compatible with compassion and social action and social justice, who could not want to see that? If, on the other hand, they become wayward or abusive or angry, that's a problem for everybody, <coughs> including their own community. So I believe in communitarianism, but we have to combine it with individual liberties and civil rights, and that's been a big struggle in the West. It's still underway, as Mehmet rightly said, in the Muslim world. C can I challenge Paul before we get <laughs> on to, to <laughs> Hannah and, and Mehmet? Awesome. Um, because uh, I think we can all speak from our, our own personal experience here. My own personal experience, I went to Sunday school until I was 14 or something like that, but really for many, many decades, religion was completely irrelevant to my life. Was I cut off from a community? Did I lack um, communal engagement? Absolutely not. There are many, there are a multitude of uh, groupings of individuals that share like-minded uh, ideas who come together uh, around those like-minded ideas and share uh, sometimes social justice um, uh, missions or art or culture or many, many different things. To assume, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that you're doing this, Paul, but it has to be said that religion is not the only way that people can come together into community. Sure. Needless to say, I agree yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank um, you. I guess uh, for me, kind of going forward, we need to go backward a little bit and that is Islam, in my understanding, was revealed to recalibrate a society, um, a society who or where girl infanticide was a practice, where treatment, um, I mean, society enslaved and bought and sold slaves, society was monstrous in its behaviour to those that were vulnerable. Um, so it sought to transform that society in a very short period of time, over 23 years, uh, through the embodiment of the messenger revealed um, and through the example of that message. Um, so before we kind of talk about Sharia, who defines what is Sharia, and at the moment, I mean, I'm making a big claim that there is, there is not a Muslim country in its Sharia, in its expression, who can be true to the principles of Islam, which are principles of human rights, social justice, uh, taking responsibility for those more vulnerable and enabling a sense of equity. These are foundational principles of Islam. If they cannot be tested against these countries, then anything that comes out of that country, as far as I'm concerned respectfully, cannot be Islamic. So the version of Sharia that's coming out of Saudi or respectfully out of Egypt or wherever else when it comes to its treatment of women and or its treatment of the vulnerable, I reject that right. That is un-Islamic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the way to kind of come back is to understand before we look at the detail is to look at if these are the principles of Islam. Who disagrees with that? I would like to know. Is anybody on the panel, the rationalist or otherwise, uh, if these are Islamic foundational principles, then how do we re-bring back societies to those principles, not argue about which faction is right and wrong, because we've all departed from those principles. And accordingly, those principles are about creating a sense of harmony in a society. They're about creating and recognising that we're not all equal, 
Some of us are differently abled. Some of us have different resources. And in Islam, we afford responsibility to privilege. That is essentially the way in which we as a society can be communal. Yes, it's our individual kind of spiritual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With it, it's a responsibility to how we interact privileges that we have. We are extended responsibilities to one another in order to ensure harmonious societies, respectful ones. And I guess I just want to kind of be a little controversial on the issue of same-sex marriage. It was a campaign. It was a campaign run in Australia and I thought it was appalling, no matter the outcome. And it was not to be celebrated. A lot of Muslims initially went, oh, yeah, yeah, well, they're right. Um, and the same-sex marriage campaign, it shouldn't be allowed in this country. Some Muslims kind of got on that bandwagon, whilst others, when you reframe the very conversation in a plural, secular society, the only thing as Muslims we can do, we're not here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires that judgment is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not with you, to cast judgment on another. So a very process that says to you, you need to judge whether this person is deemed legitimate or not, should be entitled to these rights or not. The only thing as Muslims we can do is extend compassion to a people that are being vilified in society, which were the same-sex couples at the time. So as Muslims in a secular society, I think we are not only compatible, we are compelled as an expression of our faith to uphold the society in its harmonious foundation. Yeah. Just to add quickly, uh, I, I disagree with the fact that, it d disagree with the idea that Islam is a communal religion only. Okay. It, uh, I think it's approaching from that principle of balance that I have said at the beginning. It's an individualistic religion and communal religion. When you read the Quran, it's addressing individuals directly, but it's also in addressing communities, societies. Uh, that's f first, number one. Number two, Muslim scholars very early on in 8th century identified fundamental human rights. So the idea of, and there's an expression in Arabic, hukuk nas the, the, the human rights. Um, and then there were five uh, inalienable rights, right to life, property, the mind, belief, and uh, family or lineage. And uh, they said, they argued that these rights cannot be taken away from anybody. The rulers have to respect it. You cannot pass laws against these rights. So this is very important because that really balanced or gave uh, Muslims rights uh, in, in a very in ancient world almost. Uh, so that's uh, number two. Um, and uh, the main, uh, I agree with you, uh, Hannah, that uh, the, the no, none of the Muslim states represent Islam or they're not there yet. They're actually, I would say that they're backward in terms of application of all these things mm. to the Western societies. But that doesn't mean that's Islam's fault. Exactly. There are other reasons to explain. Uh, just because they are Muslim, like wh what are we going to say if Australia fails? Are we going to say rationalism is evil or rationalism failed or Christianity failed? Mm -hmm. It's Australia failed as a society. Like uh, the, the Islam itself is a set of teachings and. It's like an instrument. If you use it well, it will work for you. If you don't use it well, you can even abuse it using it. You know. So ultimately, how we apply these things, that's really <coughs> important. Paul, if you wish to have to say something. Yeah, just uh, briefly. Uh, it seems to me it's a very important point at issue here because we can get locked into a debate about Islam, true or false, real or you know, compatible or incompatible. But that's not actually very productive. All right? What I would say is this. Just to the extent that a Muslim, and Hannah Mehmet fit this description, says we find inspiration in the Quran, in, in Muslim jurisprudence, for fundamental principles of human rights, then I would say as a rationalist, that's splendid. And I trust you understand that Christians and Buddhists and various secularists find inspiration <coughs> in their traditions where we need to converge in on those questions of human rights and putting them into practice. So don't don't hammer me over the head with your theological beliefs. Show me that you respect human rights and I'll respect your actions. The words can be empty. They so often have been mm. in theological and ideological history. You know, when the French Revolution says we're going to declare human rights, what do we end up with? The guillotine. Not a good show. Mm. So, you know, there's plenty of guilt and recrimination to go around, but if we concentrate on what those principles are and on taking actions to forward them, we'll get along just fine. Thank you. In a slightly <coughs> negative question, 
As Leiden philosopher Thomas Hobbes, as many of you will know, described the natural order as a war of all against all, in which life is nasty, brutish, and short. And Voltaire, who was an atheist, wanted his wife to be a Christian so she wouldn't cuckold him, <laughs> and his servants to be Christians so they, so they wouldn't steal. <laughs> Does religion have a restraining influence on the worst aspects of human nature? Parent. <laughs> well, I think it can. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, otherwise interpreted, it can probably do very bad things as well. I don't think it's necessarily, it, it, it's not um, sufficient. Religion is not sufficient for good behaviour. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you know, I, I would say that being a non-religious person myself, I don't necessarily go around leading a bad life. Yeah. I take responsibility for being a good person and leading a good life. That does not come from any faith. Mm. Um, it, it comes from a, a, a human, um, that humans live in societies naturally and our sense of compassion and empathy and reciprocity comes from the fact that as, as human animals, we live together in societies. It is part of natural evolution that we develop compassion and empathy and mm. we treat one another well. And it's also why we have social taboos against people who do behave badly, who behave um, harming the group as a whole. Wow, where do all these wars come from, pre and post religion and um, human atrocities? I think we're capable of both. Um, I think human uh, susceptibility and ability to behave in the most monstrous and atrocious of ways and in the most altruistic and uh, generous and giving of ways. And I think we can potentially do both. And where religion, uh, or faith rather for me, and I think importantly to make the distinction between what has been bandied around as religion and faith, Islam the faith. Um, so where faith for me um, uh, requires, and, and I think this is where some of the tensions may be in Western democracies and a system of belief that is founded on faith is that we, um, in the West, oftentimes, if we want to measure our expression of freedom, often, it's can we say what we want when we want it? Um, can we behave in the way we want? Can we dress the way we want? Can we walk butt naked in the street and not be abused and used and whatever? And, and so I think um, in our quest to measure our freedoms, we have become more and more hedonistic. That's neither good nor bad. But that is, I guess, I'm oversimplifying, but that has become the measure of a free society. Can it do all these things without constraint? Mm -hmm. As a Muslim, I equally have all these uh, temptations in the same way. If I'm thirsty, I want to drink. If I'm hungry, I want to eat. If I desire somebody, I want to jump them. If <laughs> I'm in pain, I want to... I mean, they, we're all human beings, I guess. But in, our, in my system of belief, I'm mindful of my temptations and my ego and my quest is not to give in to it, but rather to discipline it. To discipline it and engage a different level of engagement with my fellow human beings. So it's not about individual gratification alone. It's about a mindfulness of how I impact somebody else that's sitting next to me. And in refraining from the hedonistic expression, I, as a Muslim, find my coexistence in a society much more conducive to plurality and respect. Just saying. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very conscious uh, in listening to Hannah and Mehmet talk about what Islam is for them, um, that we need to constantly translate. Um, because sometimes what happens is people conflate the, the story that they live inside and the principles that they live by, when in fact the principles are shared in common with many people who actually live inside different stories. And it's those principles, it seems to me, that are really important here, more important than the stories. And my analogy for this is we all grow up speaking at least one natural language. So I grew up speaking English. 
um, if I was to go out into the world and say English is the one true language, nobody can be an authentic human being or communicate properly unless they speak English, people would think I was simply bananas. They wouldn't take me seriously. If, on the other hand, I say, look, there are many languages, I want to learn at least one other. Um, but we can understand language itself through the science of linguistics. And many people would be baffled. Uh, you need to explain what you mean by that. What I'm driving at here is that comparative religion and concentration on what's really going on beneath the stories of revelation and spirits and angels and so forth is going to get us a lot further than insisting on the truth of a particular story about revelation, be it Islam or any other. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss those stories, but, um, but notoriously they tend to get bogged down in misunderstanding and mutual recrimination. But if we concentrate on the principles that Hannah has been talking about, I think we can really get some mileage out of that. Yeah, I, my answer, short answer would be yes, religion does have a power over individual behavior. And in the case of you know, Islam, um, like individuals' behaviors are checked by law, societal pressure, and through individual conscious you know, eva evaluation. And when you look at Islamic teachings, it covers all three areas. Um, but the, the individual area is the biggest. Uh, but ultimately, human beings have to make decisions, choices themselves. And that humans, are, we are not just the mind only, we have emotional side, emotional brain. And that in most cases, uh, uh, religion does have emotional power over individuals and rational, some rational power. Uh, so I think it does its best to produce good human beings. But where it can go wrong is in the, that's what I said at the beginning, uh, when individuals do not see religion as a transformative instrument for themselves, they end up transforming it into who they, what they want it to be. And we see this you know, in our time with the issue of terrorism, uh, because when you have a, somebody in rage, then they just uh, they see suffering in the Muslim world, and they just want to take revenge of that, and or remove that or fight for it. Uh, uh, and somebody comes and puts a verse in front of them that justifies that violence. They're going to grab that, you know, and and then then you remove the moral uh, barrier between an act of violence and you know non uh, non-violent stance. So. I think uh, that really, in my mind, shows the power of, of religion uh, in shaping human behavior. <laughs> Just like anything that's powerful, uh, you know, if you misuse it again, I come to the same the conclusion. Uh, it's, it can be destructive, but if you use it for the good, it can be really good. Yeah. Well, that leads me on to the next question. Hannah was saying that uh, people want to do what they want, uh, be it... Uh, walking down the street, whatever. Um, <laughs> I think they've dealt the rest out of delicacy. So the relationship between <laughs> church and state, uh, or, or religion and state, can sometimes be very tense. Is the state ever justified in restricting religious practice if your religion involves walking naked down the street uh, or religious expression? And, and, and what is the state's role in protecting religious expression? Mm -hmm. uh, Mehmet, I think you're going to start. Oh, okay. I, in my book, I wrote a section on secularism and Islam, and uh, my argument there was, uh, instead of thinking about church, because there's no church in Islam, uh, or thinking abstractly separating Islam from politics, we need to focus on uh, separating the individual human beings who engage in politics and individual human beings who engage in religion. That should be separated. And I think that uh, Muslim scholars have learned that from a very painful experience across history. Uh, they did separate the religious, like the, the rulers could not speak for religion or they could not interpret religion. Scholars could, but the scholars in turn did not get involved in politics. So there was a bit of a convention there, understanding between the two. Uh, and I think the scholars understood that the role of religion was to provide checks and balances with the politicians, uh, that polit or state should not control religion, and religion, uh, e by, from a legal perspective and from a principal perspective, should really provide checks and balances on the on the rulers, because they're all human beings too. If they go rogue, 
they can make life hell for a lot of people. Uh, so there's an unequal balance there. I think that needs to be kept in, into account as well. And we see that today. We see that today in the Muslim world. Um, the, the, because that separation is not made, you have uh, imams or sheikhs who become political, and then in that process, uh, they have a very political appreciation of Islam, which is wrong. And then the, the rulers, they try to conform religion and take it into form, and that causes all sorts of issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, the big difference that I see is where does the authority come from in religion or in faith or in, the ins in, a, in, in an institution of religion? Uh, the principle is that authority comes from God uh, through the offices of the, the clerics or whatever they're called in different religions. So the authority comes from some supernatural entity, in principle anyway, mediated by the clerical class. Whereas in, in the state, in a liberal modern liberal democratic state, the authority comes from below, from the people. And frankly, I prefer the authority to come from the citizens. Really? Having said <laughs> that, no. having said that, I could hear that um, <laughs> if you genuinely believe in a pluralistic no. democracy, then you have to accept that people will have different uh, belief sets, including faith belief sets, some of which mediated directly with um, their god, or some mediated by clerical class. That's okay, that's part of tolerating um, the diversity of citizenry, but the in a, in a liberal democracy, what has to remain um, sovereign is the authority of the people over the political system. So where do you draw the line? Between... Between, between when there are tensions between religious practice mm. and uh, state laws, uh, for example... Oh. Well, John Stuart Mill said it well. It's the harm principle. Hmm. Where you draw the line is where people's um, actions impose harm on others. That's, I mean, that's a, a, a simple way of saying it, and obviously there are complexities in how do you interpret harm. Is it psychological harm or just physical harm? But in essence, that's really where the state has the right, I think, and is given the authority by the people to prevent the... Um, certain actions by people of faith. I mean, for example, um, uh, uh, female genital mutilation, which I know is a cultural practice rather than a religious practice, but male <coughs> genital mutilation. Um, the uh, Jews and uh, some Christians still mutilate, mutilate baby boys through circumcision. That is an unnecessary, medically unnecessary, um, uh, harmful practice which is perpetrated on young human beings who have no say in the matter. So should the state prevent it? I think they should, yes. I think, well, the state, this is where it's not even. The state in Australia, anyway, has, has outlawed female genital mutilation, but not male genital mutilation. Why? Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll move on because we're um, running out of time, but thank you. Yeah. Um, look, uh, uh, I'll come back to a base reference point in terms of my personal outlook on this. As I've said a couple of times, I grew up a Catholic. The Catholic Church was a big impediment to the separation of church and state. Um, all the way back at least to Constantine, who said it would be the, you know, well, the state religion, Theodosius enforced that. Um, as recently as the late 19th century, Pope Pius IX stipulated in the syllabus of, er of errors, as he called it, and Quanta Cura, an encyclical of AM64, that it is anathema to call for separation of church and state, for freedom of expression, for freedom of religion. That's 19th century papacy, okay? Um, so this has been a long running battle in the West and in the Christian world. If therefore there are tensions and difficulties in the Islamic world, it ill behoves people from a broad Christian cultural background to point the finger and say, well, you guys have got no idea. 
right? This is a long, complex conversation to have. Um, and one of the reasons I step away from Catholicism, despite the fact I said I've got a good family and a good community, is I thought, I've really got to think this stuff through. I've got to figure out where I stand. I could not have done that in a conservative theocratic society. I would have risked persecution. Many people who tried that in, in ages gone by did. And there are people, as I'm sure Hannah and Mamet will agree, in the Islamic world today, who suffer that because they say, I don't believe this. I'm stepping away from the Quran, uh, from the Imams, etc. And I'm certainly not engaging in jihad. There are a long list of people who've suffered for that. So this is a very complex question to work out. And if we're going to get somewhere, and we're here tonight because we want to make progress in this, not have a fight about it, we've got a lot of work to do. And it's going to require patience and imagination and a sense of history. And I applaud much of what Mehmet has said along those lines regarding the struggle in the Islamic world to sort this out. I'll be really brief. Um, there's an assumption that the people are without faith. I mean, when Meredith talks about the authority with God or the authority with people, if they are people of faith and not tolerated, but they are central to a system, then the decisions that the people are, may, are making are not to just be tolerated, but they are part of a genuine plural society. So I guess I often kind of find it difficult the way in which people of faith are referred to in a secular society. It's as though there's this norm and we are tolerated and accepted provided we accept the norm, whereas we are part of the norm. And if uh, I don't see any harm if the people were people of faith who still... And, and it would be ideal if the people had the power. At the moment, people certainly don't have the power. And what we're trying to do is mobilise people to have power in order to re-engage and make governments accountable. So um, that's just my contribution to the conversation. 